Welcome to the Haney Biz Project with Mark Haney. Mark is a serial investorpreneur and the chief dreaming officer of the Haney Biz Companies. He's working tirelessly to ignite the entrepreneurial revolution and share the inspiring stories of the region's most influential leaders. And now, here's Mark Haney. All right, all right, all right. This is the Haney Biz Project, and we are on a mission to ignite the entrepreneurial revolution right here in our hometown of Sacramento. We are entrepreneurs, helping entrepreneurs, reaching out, trying to help the next guy in line. It is not always easy. I am here with my main man, Marcus Haney. Marcus, you hanging or banging today? I am always banging. Uh, okay, that's. Uh, <laughs> I have not heard that. Now, when we're banging, that means we are at our very best, at our very best opportunity. Uh, it's good to have some downtime, but you know what? If we are business owners, uh, or anything we're doing in our life, if we want to be winning, that means we need to be at our very best no more doubt. often. And a lot of times I get caught not at my very best, so I am here to correct that. And today I am coming to you, hopefully at my very best. But today we're talking about leadership. Um, probably nothing more important in building a business, building your dream, than leadership. Marcus, talk to me about leadership. Wow, open-ended question. I appreciate that. Um, leadership. Well, you know, I take a lot of my leadership attributes from the time that I was in the military, in the Marine Corps, and I really got a good chance to look at a broad spectrum of people and their leadership styles and really had an ability to take the things I liked from some and discard the stuff that I didn't like from others and really uh, create my own way of leadership. And, uh, you know, I try to utilize that each and every day in my business. Well, I think you're a great leader, Marcus. And I think in, in leadership, uh, there's sort of a, uh, I don't know, I call it a pipeline of leadership. I mean, we start off uh, managing ourselves, right, which is not always I'm easy. I'm never good at that. And you don't, you know, progressing to that next level where you're actually managing or leading other people, that's a progression. If we can't manage manage ourselves, how are we going to progress to uh, managing or leading other people? And then in a, in a little bit larger organization, we are actually managing managers. Right. Well, who would have thunk? You know, you actually have to help develop other people to become managers. And then there's a pipeline and a progression from there all the way up to um, managing functions and managing uh, groups of businesses or, or divisions within a company. And in a larger enterprise, you actually have multiple companies. And right. if you skip those progressions in the pipeline, it can be kind of uncomfortable. It can be a little bit hard on the uh, on the organization. No doubt. Well, like in the Marine Corps, I think they did a really good job of building an infrastructure. Obviously, you know, they're a uh, long-lasting uh, organization. But you start off leading yourself by being a good team leader, right? Yeah. Or, or a good saw gunner, if you will, on the infantry side. And you move yourself up to a team lead, to a squad lead, and get yourself all the way up and to, you know, work up the ranks as, as you go. And if you miss any of those steps, you really yeah. lose a lot of credibility from your people that are watching in from the outside as well. well. And you got to somehow figure out a way to allocate your time correctly. You know, we have 13 companies here at Handy Biz. I'm invested into a couple dozen others and a number of things I do keeps me pretty busy. People ask me, Mark, how do you manage all these businesses? And I say, well, you know what? Two things. One, I don't play golf. Number two, I don't cheat on my wife. So I have a lot more time than, <laughs> than most people do. But you know what? The other people, the other thing people ask sometimes, Marcus, I'll ask it of you, who would be a role model? Who would you look up to in terms of leadership? Is there anybody out there that might be famous or that we might know of that, uh, that you would like to emulate or that you feel like you can take something away from? Uh, besides Mark Haney? Me? <laughs> yeah. Well, luckily I've had you to uh, turn to my whole life and be able to bounce things off as a good sounding board. Um, you know, I, somebody I'm going to say that is a really good leader and somebody who I know that always has great perspective on things and charging you forward is uh, a friend of mine who's also a Marine, Mark Green. He, uh, mm -hmm. he lives in New York and, you know, is in charge of a, a large majority of Marines, but he always seems to look at things from the perspective of others before he makes a decision, which I always look at and try to emulate when I am talking about uh, a specific topic or, you know, something sensitive. Yeah, we're here inside Mark Tank, and if you look around my office, you'll see things that motivate me, my purpose, my why, all around me, and people that motivate me, and they're behind my desk, uh, there's a uh, picture of Ronald Reagan, oh, and I, he's got this quote that, that makes me think about what matters most to me and it says all great change in America begins at the dinner table and I think that to me that means family 
Um, and I hope that I can be the type of leader that I don't ever expect myself to be a Ronald Reagan, but I think of maybe like a, uh, uh, in, in, from, from a sports standpoint, I want to be the type of guy that is in the game, plays the game with gusto, maybe like a Brett Favre type of guy, plays the game with gusto, but has the grit to persevere uh, when the going gets tough. And we know in business, as in life, the going is not always easy. So I hope I, I can become that type of leader. I don't know if it would be Brett Favre, but I'll give you John Gruden. Yeah. Oh, John Gruden. Yeah. People say that, I remind <laughs> him of John Gruden. So maybe I am that guy. Well, I'll tell you what, today's going to be a great show. We're going to be talking about leadership. We're going to be bringing on Mito Eldon to talk about how you know leadership is influence and how we influence people. He's my par- partner in the Haney Biz marketing effort. Uh, later in the show, we will meet Colonel Larry Broadwell, commander of the 9th Reconnaissance Wing at Beale Air Force Base. But coming up after the break, we will meet a true leader, the assistant chief of the California Highway Patrol, Johnny Fenner will be joining us. Join the revolution at HaneyBiz.com. Courtesy of Five Star Bank, this is the Haney Biz Project. Now, back to the Haney Biz Project with host Mark Haney. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courtesy of Sun System Technology. I'm Mark Haney, and I'm joined by the Assistant Chief of the California Highway Patrol, Johnny Fenner. How you doing, Johnny? I'm doing really well. Did I get your title correct? You did, but I just want to clarify, I am one of several Assistant Chiefs for the California Highway Patrol because we're so large. So oh, I'm okay. not the, I'd like to be the, the but I'm one of. Uh, well, so. uh, you have an important role. You're a woman who's worked her way up the ladder, and today we're talking about leadership. Uh, let's talk about, okay, under your command now, how many uh, teammates do you have? Uh, so just to give you context, uh, we cover what's called our Valley Division, and that covers a very wide area. It includes San Joaquin County, Yolo County, Sacramento County, Placer County, Butte County, wow. and so on. And so out of that, we have probably about 20 commands that fall under that, and so we probably have over 1,100 uh, employees throughout that whole region. Mm-hmm. And I'm part of a team that oversees them. So, yeah. Very humble. Well, we look <laughs> forward to uh, understanding that better because, uh, you know, leadership um, it is one of the things I think that trips us up a bit at, at times as we're building any kind of uh, enterprise. Um, but it can also be the, a difference maker, I think, as we, as we uh, end up uh, striving for success. Let's talk about your um, launch into the law enforcement. You didn't grow up wanting to be a uh, police officer. How did you get into this gig? I'm going to have to say no, (laughs) I did not. But uh, this might be telling of my age as well, but I grew up on chips. So, oh, Chips, the te- television show. Yeah, absolutely yeah. loved the show. Uh, thought hang gliding looked kind of cool. <laughs> and so where do I sign up? Yes. And so uh, I did. I signed up. But I was actually working in a clerical office as a typist clerk. And I didn't feel challenged. Um, I didn't know what I really wanted to do with my life. I was taking some college classes but didn't really have a clear focus. And so I decided to try the Hire Patrol. There was a big mm-hmm. ad. Uh, It talked about the security that it would provide me because growing up uh, with a single mother, I didn't have that. And so I was starting to kind of look to see what could I do that's something that would kind of take care of me. And um, and really, that was all I did was I saw an ad. I wasn't recruited. I don't have family in law enforcement. And Uh, bam. uh, Weren't you nervous? So you're a typist. uh, You're a typist clerk at the time. And now it's uh, let's go catch some bad guys. Uh, This seems like a pretty big uh, leap. Yeah, you would have to know me, Mark, back in the day. (laughs) It wasn't that big of a leap. Okay. Uh, Yeah. So I was an athlete. I played basketball. And um, because the environment sometimes that I grew up in, we moved around a lot when I was young. You know, you build a thick skin, you get tough, and you don't take a lot of mess. So I was ready. So you started off in the trenches as a police officer. Yes. Okay. So talk to us about uh, the beginning. And then how did you um, work your way up through the ranks? Um, you know, work in the field is really exciting, especially when you're young, um, because when I came on, I didn't have a very big vision of where I wanted to go or what that would even look like. So, um, I think through the process you meet people, right? I think people come into your life at different times for particular reasons. And so 
probably about my 10 year mark. I had been working the road. I worked down in Southern California in the Ontario Rancho Cucamonga area. Mm -hmm. I ended up over in the Ventura area. I worked also um, over in the Hayward Bay area and then the Stockton area, which is in our valley. And so a lot of people think of Stockton and you're like, wow, that had to be really tough. They were tough in different ways all over because of our environment okay. and the community in which you serve. It's very diverse. There's a lot of um, crime in some of the communities you work, and then there's other community things that become challenging as well. So it created growth in me as I was coming up for those mm -hmm. 10 years. And then you bring in this piece about leadership and people that speak into your life and maybe plant seeds for you. And at the time, I didn't know what the seeds were that they were planting, whether I was getting an opportunity to work an assignment that I was like rolling my eyes thinking, I don't want to do this. Yeah. But it was pushing me outside of my comfort zone. And so through that process, I began to see that, you know what, I do want to try this. And trying that was promoting the first time, which our first rank is sergeant. And I did that for a while, and I worked in our headquarters environment, which was pretty fantastic, over some programs that are statewide over our entire organization, which is 11,000 strong. And then I had an opportunity to take that back into the field and supervise others. And it was probably one of those opportunities that I didn't realize how important it was going to be for me to be responsible for other people and their actions. And that was very different for me because I was still, to me, in my 30s, a very young person with two young children at the yeah. time. And so that's kind of how the promotional process works. And then it becomes lieutenant. But people are still speaking into you. You're still yeah. developing and growing. And you learn so much along the way from good people. And your prior guest mentioned also about the right people. Yes. So. Well, I mean, you're, now you have uh, 1,100 uh, teammates uh, that you are helping lead, as you put it humbly. Um, what do you look for in a leader today? Um, for me, I look for somebody who um, has a heart, a heart for service, and somebody who has a high emotional intelligence mm -hmm. level. You know, we talk about um, intellect. I want you to be knowledgeable but I, and competent, but I need you to be emotionally solid. And again, I'm just dovetailing off of what was said before. It's so important for people to be able to read and understand people today because there's yeah. so much going on. So in leadership... Um, it's about leading people, mm -hmm. and we manage things, the processes, the paperwork, the work. But um, in the kind of uh, public safety environment that we're in today, I need people that can connect to people and really understand what's important about that as we build in them their own leadership. Yeah, I can only imagine it being such a dangerous job. It's high stress. But in today's environment, there's, uh, there's other issues that we deal with, and I'm, I'm wondering... Um, the attitude toward law enforcement has shifted in the last few years. I'm wondering how you manage that, um, those re some of those reactions that maybe we didn't have as much uh, just, uh, just a few years ago. You know, I've been on a long time. So I've been on 29 years. And so there's been a lot of shifts over okay. the years. So, okay, it's yeah. an, so it's an ebb and flow when you've been on for a long time. In the environment today, I think it's really important, especially in my role and what I try to speak into um, to our whole staff, is having a balance. And to me, it's really important to remember that we are supposed to be the scales of justice in the sense of mm -hmm. being fair and equitable. Um, we can have our own p personal opinions and thoughts, but when we come to work, we come to work to serve people. Yeah right? Because it's about humanity. So when we are, um, we understand there's certain segments of population that may not be happy with law enforcement, but we got to remember that we're about service and going out and doing our job every day. And so internally to my folks, I try to keep them encouraged because there's a large segment of the population that appreciates yes. and knows how hard it is to don the uniform every day and go out and do the work they do. So I try to find the balance in both of those for my people, yeah. as well as understanding the needs of the community and how do we meet those. Well, without a doubt, I think most of America uh, appreciates law enforcement. Unless you're pulling us over and giving us a ticket, we don't appreciate you that much at that stage. But You'd be surprised how many thank yous we get. Really? I, I, I actually have, uh, I, will, I won't call them uh, friends, they're sort of acquaintances that I see at Starbucks in my way into work and you know we all, I, all, I occasionally give them uh, a little bit of a thank you I've, I've never got around to buying them a coffee yet but I think <laughs> business owners uh, I think are uh, represent um, a group of people that truly appreciate what law enforcement does for us it, it allows us the freedom to to chase our dreams um, but I 
but I have to imagine, um, as a law enforcement officer, you're dealing with the the, the team underneath you uh, is dealing uh, in the trenches more more often, where almost every occasion they come into is either high stress or maybe even very negative. And I'm just wondering how do how do cops deal with that uh, that stress? How do you cope? Well, I will tell you, everybody's answer is going to be different, right? So you've asked me to give you a general kind of a broad overview of what I think. And, you know, one of the things that's helpful, it's it's probably several phases. One is the training that we provide to our folks that are out there in the trenches every day so that they're coming into contact with the, these different things. It gives them confidence to be able to do their job, um, to do it effectively. And, also, we have for us, uh, you know, employee services. It's called employee assistance. So if there's things that are really affecting our employees after a traumatic incident or something of that nature, they can get services for them, for their family. Um, and so I think a combination of, like I said, just the training that prepares them when they go out mm -hmm. and to provide them resources that come from our organization that say, hey, we're here to support you. And we have a peer support program as well, covers many different topics for people. Um, you know, we have people in our organization are like people out there everywhere else in any other industry. They have issues with, you know, maybe uh, divorce or they may have issues with finances. They could have issues with a lot of things. So we provide resources for them. Yeah. Well, we love what you do. And uh, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I just maybe a, a, a final thought, words of wisdom for um, you're a, a young woman, woman working her way up the ranks um, to this uh, very important position um, in leadership. Just some advice to uh, maybe another young woman that may be uh, in a similar position. What, uh, what should she be thinking as or any of us be thinking as we as we attack our, our dream? I would just say, um, you know, thinking about it is we are our own worst enemy, no matter what gender we are. Mm -hmm. And so if we can believe in ourselves and we can have the confidence and go out and have some self-initiative, right? And don't wait for somebody to come tap you on the shoulder. Don't wait for somebody to tell you that you can do it. You have to find that in yourself. And really, when you start on that journey, you'd be amazed what you're going to, you know, uncover. I love it. Thank you very much, Johnny Fenner, for all you do for uh, the state of California and keeping us safe, uh, but for sharing your story today on the show. And thanks for, uh, I know you through uh, Lauren Fenner, who is your daughter-in-law, so I feel connected. I feel like we are almost family, even though I don't know you very well. I do appreciate uh, her, and so I appreciate uh, that uh, I, I am almost part of the family now that, because she and I are so close. Uh, coming up after the break, we will meet Meet the commander of the U.S. Air Force at Beale. He is the uh, Air Force Base Commander, uh, the Colonel Larry Broadwell. Uh, will be coming up after the break. Join the revolution at HaneyBiz.com, courtesy of Audi Rockland. This is the Haney Biz Project. <laughs> Welcome back to Mark Haney, igniting the entrepreneurial revolution with the Haney Biz Project. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courtesy of Hub International. I'm Mark Haney, and today I have the pleasure of bringing on Colonel Larry Broadwell. How you doing, Colonel? I'm doing great. It's an awesome day in Sacramento. I appreciate you being here, and you know, today we've been talking about leadership, and you are a leader, a, a colonel uh, over at Beale Air Force Base. We want to get to know you and your story. Maybe walk us through your background and how you ended up here at Beale. Sure. So I'm a, um, uh, I'm a, I grew up as a, as an Army kid. Uh, 20, my dad served 20 years in the United States Army. Eventually, I found the light and decided to join the Air Force. <laughs> oh, the okay, yes, that's right. So I uh, joined the Air Force. I'm a 22 year airman now, so I've served in the Air what Force. What did your for dad think years. about that? Was he all right with that? Well, he realizes uh, after uh, many years living in a tent and in, in, in foxholes that the Air Force is good, clean living. So uh, okay, he realized I, I wised up. I uh, got it. Okay, so you grew up as, a, as an Army brat, moving all over the country, and then tell us that story of how you progressed to now. Yeah, so I, you know, I, like many young kids, I had an interest in flying, and I figured if I'm going to fly, I might as well fly for the Air Force. And so I, I walked down to the local strip mall and went to the recruiters offices and see, you know, does the Navy want to hire me? Does the Air Force want to hire me? And I actually walked by 
uh, the Navy recruiter's office and it said, close for lunch, be back at three. Uh, so I walked to the Air Force recruiter's office and the rest was history. Is that right? Wow, true. you were almost a Navy man, huh? Uh, they don't know if they would have had me hooked, but uh, I was going to at least consider them. Interesting. Okay, so you signed up, uh, you, got, uh, you got in the game. Talk to us about what it took in terms of leadership to work your way up the ranks to, to now you're a colonel. Well, like most, uh, I, would, I, would, I would guess most career fields, most entrepreneurial experiences, you got to learn your craft first. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. Spent many, many years learning how to be a pilot, learning to be the best pilot I could. And eventually, I was no longer just in the Air Force. Kind of the Air Force got into me, uh, and I wanted to serve. I really, that's what motivated me. Uh, and, and the way you're going to serve in, in the military and in many aspects of, of what you're trying to do in the community is, is learning to lead. Learning you know? to lead and getting in the game. We talked earlier about you spending some time in Iraq. Talk to us about that, how that may have shaped you and your leadership uh, style and, and, and changed you as a person. Oh, great. So I, this is a great segue. So there's a, you know, as a young fighter pilot in the Air Force, um, uh, you're, you're, you're pretty crass uh, you, you figure out that you, you know the right answer and you're just, the, you, you train to bring people along. Uh, but one of the things I learned in, um, in Iraq was leading through relationships. So I was given a task where as a, as a young major at the time, they were asking me to stand up a particular office. It was called the Office of Security Cooperation uh, as part of uh, the Iraqi staff. And that's in Baghdad area? It was area. in Baghdad, you bet. But you know what, it wasn't, it wasn't just a military uh, effort. It was a combination of the military and the State Department. And so the, the idea that the, the young major is going to walk into the room and tell these folks what to do is just, uh -huh. it wasn't going to work. Right. So I needed to learn that before I started working problems, I needed to work on some relationships. And I always carried that with me. And then how did that work out for you? So you spent some time in, uh, in <laughs> not Iraq. Very well, not very well, actually. <laughs> because, I mean, these are the ambassadors <laughs> and that kind of thing, right? Yeah, so you're yeah. coordinating uh, this effort yeah. and... Uh, right, there's a lot of egos in the in the sure. in the in the effort. Um, what does that look like today? Well, it, there's always there's always egos and agendas in the room. I think I think those that are most effective in that environment uh, have a real keen sense uh, to be able to pick out what those egos and those issues are and be able to work through them. Just understand that it's part of being a human. Uh, and if you can work and strengthen relationships first, you know, get, getting problems solved is, is, is actually easier if you, if you do that first. So that experience, you come home, obviously you're in, uh, in, a, in a war zone area in a, in a very difficult time. Um, now you come back, you're a veteran, you've uh, earned your stripes uh, uh, in, uh, in, in harm's way. You come back. Talk to us about returning and uh, the ascent in leadership uh, yeah. from there. You know, I, so, so as, the, as the commander of the 9th Reconnaissance Wing at Beale, I'm responsible for um, the entire enterprise of Air Force High Altitude ISR. And what does that mean? There's a fleet of dozens of very expensive uh, and exquisite aircraft and about 7,000 airmen that are deployed around the globe uh, providing this information, providing this mission for... Um, for our most senior leaders. And it's not just me that does it. What you'll hear if you come to the ninth wing and listen to uh, what I insist upon those that are part of the team is that everybody's a leader. Uh, you have to lead at all different levels. Uh, you know, I, I have the benefit of a certain position and a certain rank that makes certain things easier for me, but the newest, youngest airman that's just cutting his or her teeth uh, on being uh, in the military, they need to lead too. Uh, so everybody, it's leadership is more than just a position or an expectation. You don't need a title to be a leader. Of course not. So, you know, on this show, we, this show is about winning, which I, in my mind, winning is not what it says on the, uh, on the scoreboard necessarily. Winning is what you are doing when you are at your very best, right? Yeah. When you are, we call it banging, right? When you're banging, when you're at your very best, at your very best opportunity, that's a real good thing. That's how you get ahead in life. That's how you get ahead in business. I'm assuming that's how you get ahead. It is. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the military, but there's also a time where you're hanging, right? Hanging is uh, the relaxed <laughs> downtime. We all need that as well. But when we get caught in between, we're not really at our very best. We're not even really relaxing. Um, you know, things don't go so well. So I'm wondering from you, yeah. how do you how do you get your teammates to be banging, right? At their very best, at their very best opportunity. What's What goes into it from yeah. your perspective? So I think that uh, a lot of times we've... Um, a lot of times we need to focus on purpose. 
Okay. okay. Uh, too much time we, f- we focus on activities. Hey, what's the bottom line? What's the activity of the day that we're working on? We don't spend enough time thinking about our purpose. Yeah, no why. And the power of why we're doing something, why I serve in the military, why you're doing this for the community, that's, that's so much more powerful than figuring out, hey, we're going to do an interview today. It's, mm-hmm. hey, what, let's focus on why we're doing this. That's a great motivator. And yeah. I think more, more, uh, the, more we, the more time we spend focusing on uh, why, what our purpose is, making sure it's the right purpose, uh, the more successful you can make the team. Well, let's talk about America. You know, at the end of every show, we play the national anthem, and uh, America is uh, a leader in the world. Um, how do you view America now in a, and our in our awesome responsibility that we have as a leader of the world? You bet. So our our our, our ideals are unmatched. I mean, the ideals of freedom and justice. Uh, the ideals of self-determination, and the de- all, all the ideals that are spelled out in our, uh, our Constitution, that that's what sets us apart. That and our culture. You know, I think leaders need to focus on uh, the culture of their organization. You know, the more I, uh, my tour at, at, at Beale is coming to an end. Uh, and as it comes to an end, Broadwell is going to be gone and the next Broadwell is going gonna, is gonna to show up. And, and the indelible, indelible prints I leave on the organization is the culture of the organization. Yeah. And so that's what I try to focus on. So our ideals as, uh, that we are founded on, it, that's what makes us special. Our culture is what makes us special. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I encourage people to, if they're ever in, di- in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bad place, and they're ever worried about where our country's headed, take a little time and reflect on where we've been, and you'll know that we're always headed in a positive way. I love it. Uh, well, thinking about you and, uh, and and living here in the Sacramento area, living there at Beal with your family, you got a couple kids, you're you married. Um, how has Sacramento treated you? And then I want to talk about like, what are the next steps for you beyond uh, Sacramento? It, it's been great. So I, I never, I never imagined I'd live in California, but we have quickly fallen in love with this part of the community. And it, I was joking on the way over when, uh, when my son found out he, we were moving to California. He's like, awesome, dad. I need <laughs> a surfboard and nice. a wetsuit. I'm like, dude, wrong part of California. <laughs> I need to get you a cowboy hat and some, <laughs> some boots. And so we've, we've got them appropriately attired and we are immersed in the community and loving every day. And so next steps for Larry Broadwell. I don't know. You can ask my boss. I have no uh, you idea. have not been told yet. You just no. know that your tour of duty here at Beale will come to an end, yeah. and you will move somewhere from here. You well, bet. wondering how your family must think now, as a as a guy who's yeah. used to this happening, um, that seems that's your it's part of the job. But as having a fourteen year old and a twelve year old and a, and a wife who's making friends here in the yeah, community, yeah, yeah. I mean, to pick up and leave and not even know where you're going to go. Yeah. How I mean, what, how do you how do you lead that situation? So, yeah, so maybe I don't. Maybe sometimes you need to be subordinate, so let the, uh, let the spouse lead. So I'll tell you that we, um, uh, we serve as a team. I mean, we, our family serves as a team, and uh, Team Broadwell loves what we do, and uh, we're going to keep serving as long as they ask us to because it's, you know, it's, it's special. Being able to serve your nation is special. And just some closing thoughts for our listeners. Our listeners uh, are a range of people who want to be entrepreneurs, who are entrepreneurs. But I think everybody uh, listening wants to progress in their life. And, and, and part of that uh, is leading, right, and setting that example. Any, uh, any closing yeah. thoughts or words of wisdom that we can leave our yeah, audience I, with? I would. So, you know, I'd be real careful about how you define success. You know, we often want to do it with uh, some material things, let's just say. Uh, but in the end, the more uh, the more time I spend on this uh, this planet, the more time I realize those things just aren't purpose uh, are, aren't important. So what do you what do you really how do you really define your success? Uh, and in the end of the day, for me, that means was I able to serve my country. Uh, do I have my health intact? Is my family by my side? And if those things are all there, then I was successful. Colonel Larry Broadwell sharing his thoughts. I want to thank you, Colonel for coming on the show today. Uh, Very inspiring for me. I know that uh, you've inspired a number of others and thank you you for what you do for our country. When we return, I will be joined by Mito Eldon. He is the leader of our marketing company here at Haney Biz. Mito and I will be talking about social media and leveraging celebrity status as a way of influencing, as a way of leading and attacking our target market. Join the revolution at HaneyBiz.com, courtesy of the Entrepreneurs Organization of Sacramento and law firm Greenberg Troig. This is the Haney Biz Project. 
And now, back to the Haney Biz Project with investorpreneur Mark Haney. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courtesy of accounting firm Clifton Larson Allen. I'm Mark Haney, and I'm joined by my partner in marketing, Mito Eldon. How you doing, Mito? I'm good, Mark. How you doing? I'm doing outstanding, That's and nice. today we are talking about leadership and influence. In my mind, uh, leadership and influence, they go hand in hand, and marketing uh, and influence go hand in hand, and you're an expert in this realm. Talk to us about uh, how you view leadership and influence uh, it, it, is, it relates to marketing. Well, we, uh, when we talk to businesses that come in here, we always try and find out what is the thing that they're trying to do with their company. They're trying mm -hmm. to improve someone's life. They're trying to make a difference. Um, every product changes something for somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, their ability to communicate how their products or services change yeah. other people's lives, that's the essence of leadership. So what we do in, here at Haney Biz Marketing is we try and find out how they do that and to amplify that message. Yeah, and I think a lot of times it's the way we communicate. It's the message itself, mm -hmm. but it's also the way we communicate, right? It's the content in marketing, yes. but it's also how we deliver that content, how we distribute that content. Now, there's some messaging, there's some leadership that tends to um, kind of catch fire and go viral. Um, how does that happen? Well, we are, we've had social media going here for about 10 years, but we're really kind of entering into a new era. The whole social media world, it's kind of becoming the new television. I yeah. mean, it's like how everybody gets their entertainment. It's how they get their information. It's just become part of the fabric of our life. And uh, unlike TV, the content which is... Um, that, that is impactful on social media is content that has an emotional impact. It cuts okay. through. So something that somebody can connect to. Now describe mm -hmm. to me, so if I'm watching uh, something on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, last week we had uh, Jeff Rizzo on the show. And he's a YouTube sensation. He's connecting to people who are uh, trying to decide what kind of uh, fitness wear they might want to utilize. Um, how does uh, somebody connect in a way that uh, that gets emotion, right? And I I'd say that Jeff Rizzo is a total pro at what he does. Um, and if you ever watch his podcast, he doesn't just come out and say, you know, this product does this or this or this. He tells a story. He tells a story about how the product uh -huh. is used in someone's life. And the thing is. Um, telling stories is a way to bypass our logical filter. Mm -hmm. You can convey information in a way that people don't block when you put it in the form of a story. Interesting, because I always felt like storytelling made things sort of more shareable, right? If you, sh if you tell me a bunch of facts and figures, I may or may not re remember them, and they may be difficult for me to share. But if you tell me a story that gets my emotion going, that, I, that is memorable for me, I can probably retell that story. Maybe not as well as you did, but it sort of gives it handles, if you will. I find a way to pass that story on, sh make it shareable, if you will. Exactly. Is that where is that where you're coming in? It, exactly, and especially on social media because the ability to share is built right in. It's a button, mm -hmm. and so if you create something that people enjoy and they they connect to. You're just a button away from having that go to other customers that you didn't have to pay for. Yeah. And that's where the gold is. And if we're marketing, I've seen a lot of uh, advertisements where people get on, the, get on the screen. It could be on TV. It could be on the radio. Uh, and talk about how great they are and how, they will, uh, how they'll, uh, their products are uh, so game-changing. But what I've seen in terms of stories and effectiveness is when we make our customer the hero, right? If we can share the story of our customer, the before, the after, and put, um, put the, the customer as the hero, um, it's, it's so much more effective. Absolutely, because I don't care about your company or your service. I care about what your company or service is going to do for me. So if I hear how you've helped somebody else, that's going to be a lot more impactful. I'm going to listen to that. It's going to have a lot more credibility for me. Yeah, so if you advertise something that doesn't have, you use the term help me. So they need to have some kind of practical value. Right? Yes. So you can't just put out a video for no apparent reason. It's not going to get shared because uh, people... 
people want to help their friends and they might end up sharing it or uh, passing that story along if it's helpful. Yeah, and there's a lot of ways that you can help someone out. You can either entertain them or you can educate them. And a lot of times you want to kind of mix it up. You know, sometimes you put stuff out there that's, you know, very designed to kind of help them do specifically what your product or service does. And sometimes you're just trying to lighten up their day and make, mm -hmm. make them smile. Yeah, and I think about things going viral, and I, you know, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, John Allard, just had uh, prostate surgery, and um, you know, our heart goes out for John, and uh, you know, he, in, in our prayers. But it may, you know, I'm, you can see I'm growing out my mustache. I don't know if you can see that because the month of November is Movember. It's Mustache Month, and so I'm trying to regrow the '70s mustache. And uh, that all started. Uh, it started somewhere. My understanding is it started from a group of guys in Australia who decided they were going to. Uh, you know, there's so many uh, causes out there. Um, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, initiatives that are out there for breast cancer and female things and, and other things, but there's nothing out there for the guys. And so these guys in Australia decided to grow out their mustaches and somehow that went viral. Here we are in the United States years later and I'm trying to grow out a mustache. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they didn't go out there and say, you need to support prostate cancer survivors. Right. They didn't just say that because that would have not gone anywhere. What they did is they came up with this idea, the story of everybody growing their mustache uh -huh. in November. And look, here we are in California and we're, and you're doing it. Kind of made it a fun game, right? right? They've kind of turned it into a game. I'll grow my mustache if you grow yours and that kind mm -hmm. of thing for fun. But yet it raises awareness that, hey, we have some serious health issues that, uh, that uh, we need to address in our, in, in the world. Right, right. And there was also the one with the ice bath recently. Okay. Where I don't know doing, about they, that They were one. doing the ice oh, bath. Oh, yes. The, I, yes the ice, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that went viral. viral. Totally. I even got in on that yeah. and uh, dumped <laughs> ice all over myself. Um, and just thinking about sharing these, <laughs> yeah, it was cold. It was not fun. But, you know, my grandkids, I think, needed to see grandpa get wet and, uh, you know, for a good cause. But... You know, thinking about that and sharing our story and leading, um, what can we do as business owners uh, to, uh, to make our message uh, go viral, if you will? Is it, we talked about the content, but what about where we deliver it and how we deliver it? You're talking about social yeah. media. I mean, there's different places where you share this stuff. Right. I mean, the answer to the answer to the question is where's is your audience? Okay. And, um, you know, Facebook right now is the easiest way, the most uh, cost effective way to find your audience. Um, and what's great is that there is actually a repeatable, scalable process that you can implement right now. And you can actually reach your audience and be, you know, a leader for them and have them respond to you. Yeah. Well, we're going to be talking, we're going to be uh, running an Entrepreneurs Unleashed event here at Haney Biz on, uh, on January 18th. So it's a couple months away, but we're going to be talking about marketing and growing our businesses. This is a great chance for you to come out, meet Mito in person. Uh, if you want a little more Mark Haney, that's a good time to come out and visit me. Um, and we're going to be uh, sharing stories of how to grow your business. Every business uh, needs to find its secret weapon, its messaging, and how to deliver it. We're going to be helping out at that time. Um, this is also a chance for me now to, uh, to thank our sponsors. I got Marcus on the other end of uh, Facebook Live there. Um, he is usually our sponsor guy, but I'm going to jump in for him. And thank Five Star Bank, the Entrepreneur's Bank, along with Silver's HR, Kim Silver's, our good friend, people who are uh, helping the entrepreneurial community to grow. When we come back, I will share some closing thoughts, some takeaways about leadership. Join the revolution at HeyBiz.com, courtesy of Ethan Conrad Properties and financial advisors, Stiefel Financial. This is the Haney Biz Project. <laughs> Welcome back for Mark's Takeaways from today's Haney Biz Project. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courtesy of Silver's HR. I'm Mark Haney. I am back here with Marcus Haney. We've been talking about leadership. I said I wanted to be a guy that could lead with gusto and have some fun, but also uh, have the grit to, uh, to finish what I start. I am working on that every day here at the Haney Biz Project. What kind of leader, Marcus, do you see yourself as? I see myself as the type of leader, uh, you know, I don't really micromanage. I think that people who micromanage only uh, reduce the amount of creativity that their people can have. So I try to put myself into a position to let 
good people do what they're good at in order to bring out the good in all, right? Because I think as a team, everybody has their leg to stand on. And uh, so I try to give my teammates the opportunity to show their skills each and every day. You know, at the beginning of the show, we talked about people that we wanted to um, consider our role models or emulate or um, think of uh, at a, as someone we look up to. And I mentioned some names. I mentioned Ronald Reagan. I mentioned a couple of great quarterbacks that I think play football in a way that uh, I would like to lead. Um, but I have to tell you, this is the uh, – I saw on Facebook that this is the fifth anniversary of you receiving – your Purple Heart. Yeah. Yes. And I, so when I think about leadership, I think about Marcus Haney uh, faced with a tough situation, um, getting uh, shot in the leg in Afghanistan in a firefight in a time where, you know, so many times we, we think of ourselves as leaders in our own mind. Well, I'm this kind of leader. I'm that kind of leader. Uh, but you really don't know what kind of leader you are until you're put to the test. What happened uh, in Afghanistan, Marcus? Yeah. Um, well, I was out on a quick reaction force mission, a QRF. Um, had some guys bogged down on top of a rooftop, taking a lot of enemy fire, and there was uh, numerous IEDs in the location. And one of our larger vehicles, an MRAP, had gotten blown up and had no tires left in order to move out of the kill zone. So they launched our quick reaction force team to go out there and recover the downed vehicle and also give fire support to uh, the guys bogged down by the enemy fire. Uh, so we rolled up into a, um, a river washout type of thing, if you can imagine that and started receiving um, alternate gunfire from two different locations. And I ended up getting shot in the, in the right thigh, I guess just above my knee, um, in a really interesting scenario. I got shot through a can of chewing tobacco that um, you, Dad, actually sent to me. It was my last can of chewing tobacco. By the way, tobacco. I don't believe in chewing tobacco. But it saved somebody's life. There. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so the bullet was in my cargo pocket, and it, um, excuse me, the can of dip was in my cargo pocket, and the bullet went through the can of dip and into my leg. Um, firefight continued. It was the one of the biggest firefights, combat uh, uh, times that the entire deployment Employment received and a couple other people had gotten injured, but um, I ended up getting taken out of the place uh, out of Sangin Valley, Afghanistan, via helicopter. Got numerous surgeries, I wound up in San Diego, and did the uh, remainder of my therapy and um, got out of the Marine Corps in the Wounded Warrior Battalion down there in San Diego. So when I think about my role models, Marcus, and my heroes, I think of you first. Um, wow. And I and I think of you in terms of a leader because I mean we talked about this at the beginning of the show. The first thing you have to do is manage yourself, and I think leading by example. Uh, you proved um, and your team proved what they were made of on that day, um, not so long ago. And uh, I think it it leaves the rest of us thinking, what can I do? Um, and I think that that's what inspires me to uh, to carry on and uh, and drive the. Haney Biz Project uh, to the best of my ability every day. And I think it shows that you don't need to have a big title to be a leader. You don't have to be Brett Favre. You don't have to be the president of the United States. You don't need to be the chief of police to be a leader. You can be a grunt in the military, taking one for the team and coming out and leading uh, a great life and being a great father. That's an example I think we can all look up to. And, you know, it, it makes me think of a story I heard recently. And it, 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 I don't think it's I – don't, I don't tell this story, um, Marcus, to take away from your story, but it's so fresh. And I, and I read it in the paper. Your mom read it to me the other day. And it's the story that happened right down the road in Santa Rosa in the fires. And So sad. Yeah. It, and it was <sighs> – there was a man named uh, – Armando Bariz, uh, and it's a story of him and his wife, Carmen, and they were caught in the fires. They were from Southern California. They came up to Santa Rosa on vacation with the family, and the fires surrounded the house, and they had to get out now. So they jump in the vehicle, and they're racing away to get out. Uh, a tree falls in front of them, and they're forced to turn around. They're stuck. So they go back home to the vacation home that they had rented, and what are you going to do? They jumped in the swimming pool. Get out. And the swimming pool 
um, became uh, surrounded by flames and smoke and blowing up uh, propane tanks and just a an incredible um, ordeal that this uh, 75-year-old man and his wife, of, uh, who was married to for like 50 years, they spent the night in the swimming pool uh, bobbing and r- coming up for air just to hold their breath all night long. And I, and I can only think to myself how terrible of a moment that had to be spending the night in one another's arms, gasping for breath the entire night. And as the uh, the night wore on, um, Carmen um, started getting weaker. And, um, but there looked like there was a way that they could get out of the pool and, and walk across the coals to safety. And Carmen was, was on her last, was at the end of her life. Um, and because of the smoke and Armando looked into her eyes and asked her a question, um, can I borrow your shoe? And that just hit me when your mother read me this story. Can I borrow your shoe? What had happened in the night is their shoes had, uh, had fallen off in the water and Armando could only find one of his shoe. And so in his last few moments with his wife, um, he asked his wife uh, in, a, in a very special request, honey, can I borrow your shoe? And so he borrowed her shoe, he picked her up in his arms, and he carried her across the hot coals, out of the pool, and away from this terrible night. Carmen died at that time, and I just may, it makes me think, about heroes and about role models and how you want to live and how you don't need a special title to be a leader. You just need to be a special son. Maybe it's a father, a grandfather. You just need to live your life in a way that would make your loved ones proud. And in that way and on that night, Armando was that leader. So as we close out today, may we all find the guts to find a way to lead, right? To find a way to lead in a way that demonstrates courage, that leaves a legacy. You know what? We all know that uh, there are so many things we can do in this life to make one another proud. But I I am proud of today's show, Marcus. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of uh, all those who fought to um, keep people safe in in the fires around California. Um, I want to thank and salute to all of those who are fighting for our freedom, our safety, and our way of life. To Johnny Fenner, Larry Broadwell, and of course you, Marcus Haney. To the 13 stripes and the 50 stars, and to the one big American team that's always worth fighting for. Yours. Never above you. Never below you. Always by your side.